Hello, this is a video on what is called multiple comparisons. We will make a series, a few series of a few recordings on this topic. And in this first recording, I want to explain what we mean by multiple comparisons and discuss a problem uh, that comes with these comparisons called the false discovery problem. And for people working in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, uh, the so-called false discovery problem is a very big one and is currently attracting a lot of interest. So prior to watching this recording, you should have read the notes, read through them at least, uh, the multiple comparisons part one. Okay. So I want to explain what we mean by multiple comparisons. Recall we studied ANOVA. Uh, we only limited ourselves to the one factor case, but still uh, the concepts hold even for larger experiments. So in ANOVA, recall, we do an overall F test to determine if the experimental factor is potentially significant. That is, it has a real impact on the response. But also remember that our factor has multiple levels. So in saying that there is an, a significant effect of an experimental factor, for instance, the meat packaging method, the example we studied, only says that some of the levels of that factor are different. ANOVA by itself does not explain to you which levels are different. And obviously to a scientist or engineer, an obvious question is, OK, you think that there are differences in the response between these different levels of the factor, but which ones are different? And that turns out is not an easy question to answer. In fact, as you'll see, there is no perfect answer to it. But ANOVA by itself simply says some of the treatment levels are different. It doesn't tell you which ones. And what we're going to focus on are what are called unstructured comparisons. Basically, they're just different ways of statistically comparing the different treatment means and seeing if they're different. And some people refer to this as post hoc analysis. That is analysis after we've done the original ANOVA. Okay. So basically, I'm on slide four. And by the way, I will not cover every single slide in this section. Uh, I'm just going to hit the important highlights, things I want to emphasize. And I'll leave it to you to read the rest of the notes. So in these so-called unstructured comparisons, we basically have some number of levels or groups. And we just do all possible comparisons between them. And the exact method of those comparisons uh, will depend upon the specific answers we wish uh, to have answered. So there are no strategies in advance that says, I'm going to only compare these levels um, or some combination of levels, what we actually focus on is just comparing them in different ways to see which might be different. Now, I mentioned the false discovery problem. And again, what we mean by false discoveries are, are the following. You compare two different treatment levels. You decide that they're statistically different. In other words, they're significant. But it turns out they're actually not different. You've made a false discovery. You found a difference between two treatment levels, which isn't real. So in the context of pharmaceuticals, for example, you might compare a treatment for some condition to a placebo. And you decide, oh, the treatment really uh, improves the patient's condition. But it could turn out later on that that was a false discovery, and there really is no difference. So false discoveries are a problem. And as you're going to see, in making multiple comparisons, this issue of false discovery uh, becomes a rather big and a rather important issue. 
And the more comparisons you make between treatments, the more false discoveries you're likely to make. Okay. So again, uh, we're going to call these multiple comparisons. They are known by uh, many different names in statistics. And by the way, we're going to look at four methods that are supported in the JUMP software. But dozens of these tests exist of all types. I wouldn't pretend to know all of them. And it seems like they are still proliferating. People have been studying this problem since Fisher's initial work with ANOVA and design of experiments in the 1920s. And this issue of false discoveries continues to attract a lot of attention. Okay. And if you've studied, uh, say, an introductory statistics course, you were introduced to hypothesis testing and the problem of what are called type 1 and type 2 errors. A type 1 error is a false positive, or I like the term false discovery. It means the same thing. You reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis was actually true. So in a false discovery, you decide that two different treatments are different, but in fact they were not a false discovery. Type 2 errors will, are basically occur when you fail to find a difference between two treatments. In other words, you statistically say, I can't find a difference, but it turns out they really are different. So these are called false negatives or type 2 errors. The problem we have in multiple comparisons are that type 1 and type 2 errors are related. Basically, the more type 1 errors you make, okay, the less type 2 errors. So if I make a lot of false differences, then I'm not likely to miss real differences. Likewise, if I make very few false discoveries, then I'm likely uh, to miss a lot of important differences. So basically, they're related. I'm not going to dwell on it uh, to a great deal. I just want you to learn about the problem of these comparisons between treatment groups and the problems of the errors that occur. Okay. So we need some terminology. So when we do these multiple comparisons, the total number of comparisons that we can do is called the family of tests. That's the set of all the comparisons that can be performed. When we do one comparison, we have what is called the comparison error rate. That is, for a single test, what are the chances of making a false positive or false discovery? And let me grab a little pointer option. And if you, in studying statistics, this is called the significance level of the test often set to 0.05, which is controversial, but that's a tradition. So we call this a simple comparison-wise error rate. For a single comparison, here are the chances of a false discovery. But what it turns out, and this is important, is over the entire set or family of these tests, the chances of making a false discovery go up with the number of tests. And we call this the family-wise error rate, and that's the problem. So if we make, a say, a large number of comparisons, we are almost guaranteed to make false discoveries. So in general, this so-called experiment-wise error rate is always larger than the comparison-wise error rate. And in fact, this family-wise or experiment-wise error rate can become unacceptably large. And that's a problem in pharmaceutical research because it means you could be making a lot of false discoveries in terms of the efficacy of drugs.
I'm not going to go into all the details on slide 9. A couple of important points. If I have my experimental factor and it has A levels, the total number of comparisons can be shown to be A times A minus 1 over 2. Okay. So if A were 4, there'd be 6 comparisons. Okay. If A were 5, there'd be 10 comparisons. And at the bottom of the slide, I show a mathematical formula, which I will not require you to remember. Um, but it's derived from the binomial distribution. And this is the probability of making at least one false discovery in a set of P comparisons. Okay. And on slide 10, I just give you an example. So if we had eight treatments and we wanted to compare them, we would have to do 28 comparisons. And the chances of making at least one, at least, that's a key word there, false discovery, is 0.76. In other words, 76% of the time you made this many comparisons, you'd have one or more false discoveries. Okay, so this is why the false discovery problem uh, gets so much attention, because in these days, in some areas like genomics, you might make 50 million comparisons, in which case the chances of a false discovery are indeed very large. In fact, you're assured to make them. And I'll talk about the very large uh, false discovery problem in the multiple comparison notes part two, and that's a video I'll do a little later on. Okay. And I quickly wanted to do a review. So if you've had a statistics course, you're familiar with what's called two-sample inference. That is making a comparison between two populations or groups. And the most common method is called the two-sample t-test. I cover it here because this actually is one of the basic ways to make multiple comparisons between treatment groups. Okay. And previously, we discussed the mean square error and the root mean square error. And this was discussed in the one-factor experimental case. Okay. And just as a reminder, at the top of slide 12, this is just your basic formula for computing the sample variance. Again, the sample variance is the measure of the random variation or noise in the response. Okay. And also, and this was part of the review, but I wanted to go back to it, the variance, S squared, is the variation in a single measurement. But in multiple comparisons, we are typically comparing averages. Therefore, when you, when you look at the variation in an average, okay, since it's based upon averaging of observations, its standard deviation has a special name. It's called the standard error of the mean. And it's just the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, the sample size. So most of the time in our methods that we're going to discuss, since we're talking about differences between averages, we will work with what's called the standard error of the mean basically the amount of random variation that exists in an average. And since the denominator is the square root of n, you can see as the sample size gets larger, the variation in the mean goes down. In fact, averaging is basically a way of filtering out noise. Noise averages out. So one of the reasons why we replicate and we want replicate measurements are we can measure the average more precisely, meaning there's much less error or noise in our measurement. 
So remember the standard error because that's the basis for these multiple comparison methods because all the ones we're going to talk about are based on comparing averages between the groups. Okay. And I'm not going to go through all of the arithmetic, but on slide 13, basically I go through the calculations of the uh, what's called the pooled standard deviation. Okay. The pooled standard deviation is just the overall standard deviation, which is a weighted average calculated from all the treatment groups. So at the top of the slide, if there are only two groups, that's the formula. And then you'll see in the, about the middle of the slide, there's the formula for three groups. And this formula then generalize, or generalizes to any number of groups. And then finally, for the two sample t-test, at the bottom is an important result. And we use this uh, considerably in putting together multiple comparisons. This is the standard error for a difference in two averages. So if I'm comparing two different treatment groups, I'm, I'm usually comparing their averages, this formula gives you the variation or noise that exists in that difference. In other words, how much noise exists in my measured difference. Okay. So this is important to understand one standard error into the standard error of a difference. Okay. So in this next section, we're going to talk about how do we reduce the false discovery rate. And it turns out there's actually no really completely perfect answer uh, one of them, by the way, one of the oldest, is based upon actually altering the comparison-wise error rate. Remember, uh, traditionally, people use 0.05. If the significance of your test is below 0.05, you reject the null hypothesis. Well, using 0.05, as I showed you on a previous slide, can lead to prohibitively large um, false discovery um, levels or experiment-wise error rates. One of the solution, and I'll show in a moment, it's called the Bonferroni solution, is to use a much smaller threshold for rejection. So instead of 0.05, maybe I use 0 0.008, and then over, say, six comparisons, the experiment-wise error rate is only 0.05. OK, that looks good, but it comes with a price. And the problem is, and I'm going to skip slide 15. You can take a look at it. This shows you the uh, experiment-wise error rate as the number of comparisons goes up. OK. And I'll show you later in JUMP um, in the FIT Y by X platform, uh, slide 17 shows you how you can change the significance level for a single test. Okay. So the basic idea is I calculate for the entire family of tests a single significance level or comparison-wise error rate such that over all the tests, the total experiment-wise error rate does not exceed, say, 0.05. And this method is very old and was first suggested by an Italian statistician and probabilist named Bonferroni. Okay. And Bonferroni's method is still used. There are different areas it's used in statistics. And overall, the method looks good, but it does come with a price. And I'm going to get to that. And Fisher, by the way, who first looked at this problem. In other words, he realized right away when he did ANOVA, you simply rejected based on the F test. There needed to be some sort of post hoc analysis to decide which groups were different. So Fisher had what he called his protected procedure, although it's not really very protected, unfortunately. He'd say first, 
if the overall F test in the ANOVA table rejects, that suggests there are real differences, then perform two sample T tests between all possible groups to determine which groups might be different. Okay. The problem with that approach is, although it is quite powerful, as we'll show later, it also leads to a lot of false discoveries. So we'll continue this uh, discussion in a moment, but at this point you should at least try to be familiar with the idea of the false discovery problem, and you should have reviewed the notes on two sample inference, so you're comfortable with the idea of the standard error of the difference in means.